the civil rights, these anti-discrimination acts did not come to fruition until the 1960s. Now, America was in existence for huh, centuries before these laws were actually put on the books. So, all right, we're marching on. We have some progress. All right, Voting Rights Act, 1965. So, the Voting Rights Act, again, huge, huge piece of legislation, was signed into law by President Lyndon Baines Johnson, and it, the whole premise behind the Voting Rights Act was to overcome legal barriers at the state and local levels that prevented African Americans from exercising their right to vote. All right, so, a couple of things with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Number one, Section 5. Now, Section 5 of the Act contains a quote-unquote preclearance requirement that requires certain states and local governments to obtain a determination by the United States Attorney General if they are going to institute any type of changes to voting laws and to voting regu regulations. Very, very huge pre-clearance. That was purposely aimed at the southern states. So uh, these poll taxes or literacy tests or grandfather clauses could be examined if they try and pull any stunts after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So section five, very, very important. In addition to Section 5, the pre-clearance article, Section 4B of the Civil Rights Act of 1965 actually contains coverage formula that determines which states and local governments are actually subject to the pre-clearance requirement under Section 5. So Section 5 and Section 4B actually worked hand in hand to prevent any of this history of repeating itself. Now, while all this was going on, looks like we're doing pretty well, right? Huh. Guess what? Who enters the picture? Well, James Crow Esquire. Anybody heard of James Crow Esquire? All right, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. James Crow Esquire. He is the more sophisticated cousin to Jim Crow. James Crow Esquire wears a suit and a tie instead of a robe and a hood, right? Unlike Jim Crow, who used violence to maintain power, James Crow Esquire actually used the law to further the ends. What did that look like? All right redrawing districts, gerrymandering, all right, uh, legislative districts to dilute the power of the disenfranchised. Unlike his cousin Jim Crow, James Crow Esquire would never use the N-word, at least not in public. <laughs> Instead, James Crow Esquire talked in code some of those code words we've, we've heard before. States' rights, or welfare queen. Right, this is James Crow Esquire at work. Right, so while we are seeing some achievements in the area of law that's eradicating some of these racist um, statutes or practices, don't keep your eye on the ball. All right. So, in the same vein as James Crow Esquire had a monumental Supreme Court decision that came down in 2013, Shelby County versus Holder. Now, 2013, Supreme Court actually ruled five to four, very, very close, that the constraints placed on certain states and federal review of their voting procedures were considered outdated. So, in essence, what the Supreme Court did is that they gutted Section 4B, 
from the Civil Rights Act. Now, Section 4B, as you recall, actually contained the coverage formula that determines which jurisdictions were subject to preclearance. Right, they did not abolish Section 5, preclearance, but because they gutted Section 4B, Section 5 was moot. So, huge, huge, huge implications with Shelby County versus Holder. Now, immediately, and I am not lying about this, as soon as this Supreme Court case came down, you saw states that same day implement voter restrictions, voter suppression acts that were going on. So this all goes back to how the law, okay, can both erect barriers and eradicate barriers. So you're seeing how cyclical this works. Moving on. So as a result of Shelby County versus Holder, we've seen some significant regression in this particular area, one of which is voter ID laws. So so little statistics for you. Since 2013, we have seen 36 states requiring identification at the polls. Seven states have very strict voter ID laws, which um, voters must present when they go to the polls. And some states have even restricted it to certain types of voter IDs that are available. Let me give you an example, the great state of Texas. Texas actually allows a person to go to the polls with a gun permit and that is acceptable, whereas a college student with a picture ID, that is not an acceptable form of ID. Great state of Texas, all right. So these strict ID laws are part of an ongoing strategy to suppress the vote. Over 21 million United States citizens do not have qualifying government issued photo identification. So, and guess what? These citizens are disproportionately voters of color. That's because voter IDs aren't always accessible for everyone. The ID itself can cost, can cost some serious money. And even where these IDs are free, applicants can incur other expenses to obtain the documents that are needed to get the ID. So <laughs> if you don't have your social security card, that's an effort to go down to find a federal building, uh, to get your social ID, a social ID, social security card. All right, so they're putting up barriers um, to discourage folks um, from obtaining these documents. So this has been a significant burden on people in lower income communities. The other thing is travel, okay? Sometimes travel is required to secure these voter ID cards, and that can be an obstacle for people with disabilities, for the elderly, or people who live in the country or in the suburbs or in rural counties, if you will, where transportation is not accessible. So you see the game that they're playing here. All right, so in addition to that, what we have seen, all you have to do is turn on the TV and you're seeing this happen all the time. We are going into a presidential election. So all of these topics, <laughs> you're gonna be seeing them as we get closer to the election. Voter purges. <clears throat> all right, so cleaning up voter polls, <clears throat> the voter rolls, it, you know, it's a responsibility as part of the whole election administration because people will move, people will pass on, or um, uh, they may become ineligible for other reasons. But sometimes, sometimes 
states use this process as a method of mass disenfranchisement. So they will purge eligible voters from the rolls for illegitimate reasons or based on inaccurate data, and they won't provide any type of notification to the impacted voter. So a lot of times you have folks, they have no ideas, they've been taken off the polls, and they have not been allowed to vote when they show up at the polls. So a single purge can stop up to hundreds of thousands of people from voting. We're seeing this in Ohio. We're seeing this in Georgia. We are seeing this in Texas. Oftentimes, again, voters will find out when they show up at the polls and they are not on the rolls. So, further voter purges. Okay. Ah, <laughs> We've seen this. <laughs> North Carolina, redistricting and gerrymandering. All right, so the census, U.S. Census is taken once every 10 years. So every 10 years, states will redraw their district lines based on the population data gathered from the U.S. Census. Okay, so when redistricting is conducted properly, district lines are redrawn to reflect population changes and racial diversity. But oftentimes, <laughs> that's not the motivation behind gerrymandering or redistricting. It is a political tool to manipulate the outcome of elections. All right, <laughs> anybody pay attention to what's going on in Alabama? Alabama, recently Supreme Court held, it's requiring the state to redraw their lines and the state is actually refusing to comply with the Supreme Court. Now, <laughs> what's going on there? <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting to see how that's gonna turn out. So, the Census Bureau actually releases data, so they're using the data from 2020 um, to redistrict the lines. So, um, number 45, you know who I'm talking about, actually had, when it comes to the U.S. Census, he actually wanted to add a citizenship question to the census. <laughs> and that was the goal of which was to suppress participation of immigrant communities. <laughs> so, immigrant communities. So, immigrant communities were afraid to actually fill out the census data because <laughs> they didn't know if they were gonna get visited in the night by a representative from the government. All right. So, Everybody needs to be counted, but we have seen time and time again how redistricting and gerrymandering actually is used to keep uh, one political party, <laughs> in my opinion, in power. All right, so other things. Felony disenfranchisement, all right. so. A felony conviction, as we know, can come with some drastic, drastic consequences, including the loss of the right to vote. Okay, some states like Massachusetts ban voting only for those who are incarcerated. It's your out, you're eligible to vote, All right? Other states and jurisdictions like Maine, Vermont, Washington, D.C., do not disenfranchise people with felony convictions at all. So. The fact remains that you're looking at Florida. Now, Florida did some serious work down there to advocate for uh, convicted felons to vote. But the governor actually was playing, pulling some stunts and tried once again to use the law to construct a barrier for these individuals not to receive the right to vote. So, why am I saying all this? So, who is actually affected 
by voter suppression. All right. Short answer is all of us. All right. So these are some statistics and numbers. This is real, ladies and gentlemen. So one in 16 African Americans cannot vote, cannot vote in 2023 due to disenfranchisement laws. Counties, statistics show that counties with larger minority populations have fewer polling sites and poll workers per voters. 2018, what was going on in 2018? Hmm. Latinx and African American were twice as likely as whites to be unable to get off work while polls were open. 25% of voting age African Americans do not have a government issued photo ID. This is pretty sobering. Geographic isolation is also a major barrier, particularly to the Native American community, due to the inaccessibility of nearby polling locations on many of the reservations. For example, in South Dakota, 32% of Native voters cite travel distance as a factor in deciding whether to vote. Again, here we go. More than one-sixth, or 18% of voters with disabilities reported difficulties voting in person in 2020. Right. Nearly two-thirds of polling places had at least one impediment for people with disabilities. All right. Again, this is 2023, and this stuff is still going on. So what can we do? Number one, vote. Simply vote. As I said, vote like your life depends on it, because it does. Secondly, know your rights. Okay, when you go to the polls, if your name is not on the poll list, you can request a provisional ballot. Now, back in the day when I worked in New York, I was, they actually would have attorneys at the polling sites in New York State. I was one of those attorneys. So if somebody had a question, a poll worker had a question, you give them a provisional ballot. Know your rights. I would also add, research your, research, research, research what you are voting for. Again, a lot of folks can disguise, all right? A lot of folks can disguise uh, behind the words what their true intent is. So you need to read and research the issues. All right, Shelby County <sighs> passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. This here is again where the law can eradicate barriers. The whole purpose behind the Voting Rights Advancement Act is to correct the deficiencies that were laid out in the Supreme Court decision in 2013. All right, Congress can actually restore preclearance and can restore uh, the formula used to calculate that. I would encourage you to join or donate to civil rights organizations. Okay, here's a plug for the NAACP. <laughs> the NAACP, the ACLU, the Lawyers Commission for Civil Rights. Uh, and the other thing is, there's strength in numbers, and we have seen that. Unions have swayed elections countless times. So I would encourage, <laughs> Organize, organize, because the stakes are incredibly high going into 2024. All right. You've seen my face and heard my voice long enough. I thank you for your indulgence. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, 
Um, but I will be available to answer any questions. Thank you.